With great power comes great responsibility. That feels like the theme of Nina's Sequencer 2.0, but don't let that intimidate you. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through how to use the new sequencer. We'll go through some practical examples. Welcome to Alaskan Astro. Right off the bat, this is gonna be a longer video than usual, so hopefully I figured out how to use YouTube's little timeline tool and there's some links to different parts that you may be interested in down at the bottom here. Those of you who know me know it's no secret that I am a huge fan of Nina, nighttime imaging and anarchy, astronomy. Nina's new advanced sequencer available in the nightly downloads is a huge overhaul to how you run your rig that gives you incredible control over exactly how you want it to work. In this video, I'm going to avoid comparing it to the old sequencer since I really think it's best to just learn the new one from scratch and not bring any preconceived notions from the old one. That said, you're probably going to recognize a lot of the same stuff. The most important thing to understand about the new sequencer is that it's going to do exactly what you tell it to. That means there's a little bit less hand-holding, but it also means there's a lot more room for customizability of how exactly you want it to run. So before we jump into any actual sequences, let's talk a little bit of terminology. Instruction sets are an object to contain things. There are three types of instruction sets. There's parallel instruction sets, where everything happens at the same time. Sequential instruction sets, where things happen one after another. And DSO instruction sets, that are just a special sequential set that also has target information. Instruction sets are where things go, and you can also nest instruction sets inside other instruction sets. So let's talk about those other things. Instructions are the meat of your sequence. They're the actual commands that tell your stuff what to do. They can be something like slew to coordinates and center, or switch filter, or start cooling your camera. Triggers are things that happen only when specific criteria are met that Nina is checking after each instruction. That could be things like when to dither, or run autofocus, or do a meridian flip. Triggers affect the instruction set that they're in, and any nested instruction set inside of that. Loop conditions will just tell the instruction set to keep looping through until one or more of the criteria are met, and then it'll move on to the next thing. This is where a lot of the really cool customizability in the new sequencer comes in. You can get pretty creative with these. And finally, templates are just saved sets of all these things. You can make them as broad or as specific as you want. Let's look at some actual sequences and see how we can work these things together, and it should start to make a lot more sense. In this first example, I want to go into a little bit more detail of how we would actually add individual elements to a sequence. But why are we starting in the framing tab? So this is usually where you're going to start. You're going to get your framing how you want it, and then you would go to Add Target to Sequence, Sequencer, and then you'd choose one of your templates that you've already built. So let's just choose a random one here. And you'll see it already imports everything uh, of how you would have already built it. So let's talk about how we would build one of these. In this first example, I want to build something that would be like the most bare-bones thing we could think of. Basically controlling a DSLR or a one-shot color camera on a star tracker. Honestly, this is just going to be a glorified intervalometer. So let's see how we would do that. So the first thing I'd do is drag in a deep sky object sequence. And this is one way that you can add things to the sequence builder area here is just drag and drop. You can also search for things, like we're going to do that next as an example. All we really want to do is tell it to take an exposure. So I'm going to search for uh, exposure and we can see it came up here, otherwise we could have just scrolled down and looked for it. And I'm going to use this take many exposures and drag it into the instructions there. So once you have this instruction here, you need to change the parameters. I'm going to show you how we would actually set this up for looping. So right now we're going to leave the amount at 1, but let's change the exposure time to something more reasonable, like 60 seconds. We'll keep it as a light frame, binning is fine gain and offset uh, you'd probably change when you have your camera connected or just it would leave it at the defaults that you'd set in the equipment tab. So to get this to take more than one picture before it decides it's done we're going to add a loop condition. 
So we're going to go over here and add, let's say, loop until time. And then let's choose until sunrise. So we're going to be taking pictures all the way until sunrise. Now this time just auto fills in based on the location that you told Nina you exist in. It figures that out for you. So what's going to happen now in this sequence is it's going to take one exposure. It'll be a 60 second exposure and then it'll check the time. It'll ask, is it 1111? If it's not, it's going to take another exposure and it's just going to do that all night long until it hits 1111 and then it'll just stop taking pictures. This is the absolute most basic way I can explain of how the new sequencer works. Let's pretend that we wanted to use this template we've built to shoot Orion. So I'm just going to call this something like the Swissa single exposure loop. And then I'm going to click on the templates and I'm going to drag and drop this over here. And now I have a new template down here at the bottom called Swissa single exposure loop. Now let's say again that I wanted to shoot Orion. So I'm going to pull up M42. I would adjust my framing however I wanted it here and then add target to sequence, sequencer. See now we have that template here. So let's click on that and we can see it added this new instruction set, a DSO instruction set down below and it has all the stuff that we had there but it also has this target information. So since we're taking a picture of Orion let's do something a little tricky. We're going to add another exposure thing in here. So I'm just going to copy this and then change this to 10 seconds. So now what would happen in this is it's going to take one 60 second image and then it's going to take one 10 second image and then it's going to loop. So it's just going to go back and forth between 60 second exposures and 10 second exposures, which might be helpful if you're taking a picture of Orion to try to get that core. This next example, let's pretend we have a one shot color camera on a go-to mount and that's about it. So the first thing that's different is we have some stuff up here at the sequence start area. We just have two sequential commands. It's going to cool the camera and then it's going to unpark the scope. This red angular exclamation mark is just validating something and telling me something's not going to work, which says the camera does not have a cooler. That's true because I'm connected to Nina's simulator camera. So normally that would be fine. But these exclamation marks are really helpful when you're actually ready to run your sequence because it'll tell you something is not going to work right. So it would cool the camera, unpark the scope, and then since those are done, it'll jump into this DSO instruction set called Triangulum Pinwheel M33. So it's going to jump down to the instructions and we have this first one called center that gives a command to slew to the target. And again, we have that target information since we're using the DSO container here. So it slews on plate solves, centers it up exactly how you set it from framing. And then once that's done, it will start guiding and then jump into this sequential set. So similar to the other one, it's going to take a 90 second exposure and then it's going to look at these loop conditions. So for this one, I have two different loop conditions set. I have loop until time and loop while altitude above. So each time it completes a picture, it's going to look at what's going on and say, okay, is the target still above 30 degrees? Yes, let's take another exposure. Is the time, and I would need to set this, let's say we want to do that until uh, dawn. Is the time eight in the morning? Uh, it's not eight yet, so let's take another exposure. So it's just going to keep doing that. In our case, it would go until about 3 a.m. when it drops down below 30 degrees. Then it would move on to the next thing. The reason I have the loop conditions down here in this set and not up here is because I only want this exposure to loop. If I had the loop conditions up here, every single time it takes an exposure, it would also center and plate solve and start guiding over again. So again, just want to keep the loop where we want it to actually loop. That whole time, these triggers up here in this higher level, uh, it's going to check against those as well. So this meridian flip one, it's just always going to be asking, do I need to do a meridian flip? Yes, no. And when it does need to do one, it'll do the meridian flip. 
Same thing with dither after exposure. It's, it's just counting exposures every one, two, three exposures. It'll send a dither command and it'll just go along. So again, once we finish up this, it looks, is there anything left to do? Are there any more instructions? No. Then it would move on to this next instruction set called Bode's Galaxy. This is M82. It's almost exactly the same. Um, actually, everything is exactly the same. So we'll just start taking those pictures, looking at the triggers and the loop conditions. The only difference here is that the loop condition, the dawn time, is what's going to tell it to end um, instead of the altitude, because I live in Alaska, it's always above 30 degrees. So it would just hit dawn and stop taking pictures. And then, I actually forgot to add this, but here's a good example. Once it's done, I would want it to park the scope, park the mount, and warm up the camera. So it would just, and we can reverse the order of those, and that would be a completed sequence. Once you're ready, you would just hit this start sequence, and then you could hop over into the imaging tab, and there's this little summary over here that'll show you at what stage in your sequence it's working through. Finally, this is a little more advanced system with a mono camera and autofocusing. This is actually pretty similar to what I run on my rig, so I'll walk you through it. So first off, I have this thing called Newt Startup West. Uh, what it does is in parallel set, so it does these at the same time, it cools the camera and moves my focuser close to where it's usually focused. Then it'll wait until nautical dusk, so there's stars out, but uh, maybe don't want to actually start shooting before then. Then it'll unpark the scope, slew to an alt as coordinate where I always know it's going to be clear of the trees. It'll run autofocus. It'll start guiding and force calibration on so that PHD2 gets a fresh calibration that's good for my off-axis guider. It'll guide for about 10 seconds or so just to start building the log and then it'll stop guiding. It'll have finished the startup stuff and then move on to, uh, in this case, IC410, the tadpoles. So same as the other, just jumps right into the instructions centers up our target with plate solving. It starts guiding using that calibration. So then it goes down here and I've got something set up a little interesting. So the first thing is an O3 filter. So it's going to, because we're using the smart exposure instruction, it knows it needs to switch to the O3 filter and then because of this trigger in the upper level here, autofocus after filter change, it's going to run another autofocus routine on that O3 filter. Then it'll take its 300 second exposure and uh, it'll just keep looping this. And it's gonna be dithering every three frames. The whole time it's gonna be looking for meridian flip and it'll autofocus if the star size increases. Now, this bit here, the moon altitude, it will continue doing this loop until the moon is above 10 degrees, then it'll move on to taking HA subs. So again, smart exposure, the HA filter, it will go to the HA filter, and because of this trigger up here, it'll autofocus after the filter change, so it'll run an autofocus on HA, take exposures, dither, and this one will loop until the object drops below 40 degrees, so I don't know, sometime around 5 in the morning or something. And then it would go on to the next thing, this last example, let's assume that we have filter wheel offset set up. So instead of having to run a fresh autofocus cycle on each filter, Nina knows how much to move the focuser for each filter so it's in focus. So as this one goes through, again, same thing, just start out with center and guiding, then it goes into this LRGB loop. So again, we're using this smart exposure command. We could probably get away with just take multiple exposures, but there's different ways to do this stuff. So it takes three L subs, then it moves to three three R subs and it'll know how much to move the focuser, then it'll go to three green subs, then three blue subs, and it'll look at these loop conditions and ask the same questions. Should I keep going? Yes, it keeps going. This one we have the moon in there again as well. So the moon rises, then it'll move on to the next thing uh, within this same DSO instruction set. So same target, but once the moon rises, it's then going to move into this one that tells it to start taking HA subs on a different time. And it'll just do that until nautical dawn. Then when it's done, it'll stop guiding. And again, forgot to add it, but we would probably just park the scope and warm up the camera at the end of it.
that's hopefully about all I really need to teach you. There's a whole lot of other instructions and things you can add if you have a dome or if you have a flip flat. It's really just limited by your imagination and the equipment that you have, what you can do with this. You can even hack together some error recovery if you think of ways to do that. It's pretty incredible all the different stuff that you can do. Uh, the only other thing here, there's a targets, which is basically just saving a template with uh, target information so that you can pick that up and it'll save your framing and your rotation, which can be handy if you don't want to save the whole sequence down here. But yeah, otherwise, just play around with it and have fun, see what works for you. I hope that introduction was helpful for you and maybe you even have some creative ways to make this work with your own rig. Just remember, I'm right there learning this along with you. Even if it's working well right now, this is still considered experimental, and the Nina developers are constantly adding new features and bug fixes, so it's important to stay up to date with the latest nightly. Otherwise, Merry Christmas and remember to wear a coat, because it gets cold out there.